Okay then, well, we are live with Space Rock's Uplink episode 26. And uh, Mark McCorkman, uh, you are now live. How are you doing? Very good, Alex. Good to see you again. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, um, it's always good to be back on Uplink. It seems like we haven't been keeping to the, the most regular of schedules, but uh, something I look forward to every time we do it. Indeed, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, as I survey who's joined us over 26 episodes, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, you know, it's pretty extraordinary, you know, who we've been able to or privileged to share time with and, and share ideas with as well. But, you know, uh, tonight's guest is unique for so many reasons. Where to even begin with Fred Hayes? Well, let's begin with this picture, which is behind me here. You know, I mean, it, people know Fred is uh, one of the crew of Apollo 13, and I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. But for me, as a 16 year old in 1977, uh, the um, approach and landing test of the, the, the test shuttle, the Enterprise. Uh, and there's your science fiction connection straight away, the Enterprise of all ships. Um, you know, th those were just amazing to me as a 16 year old uh, to watch this, this big machine, the heaviest glider ever flown, descend from the back of a 747 and land uh, out there in California at Edwards Air Force Base. And, and, you know, Fred was the pilot. He was one of the pilot, the crew there. And as he, as we just briefly touched bases with him, you know, the pressure was on when they were flying that. So I'm really, really looking forward to talking to him about about these uh, flights as much as Apollo 13, which is just utterly iconic. Indeed, I mean, I, there are so many questions. You know, uh, I mean, the, the human factor. Uh, so many things related to what going to space reflect about. You know, what humans are capable of, what we can adapt to. Um, but I think so much has been taken from the story of Apollo 13 simply because it's about what happens when the chips are down and how you respond to those situations. And I don't think there's a management book that's been written that doesn't refer to it in some way simply because it was not about one individual's efforts. It was about an incredible team of people. And I suppose so much of space travel is about the wider group, not just the individual. And uh, I, I guess what Apollo 13 represents is the very best example, I think, of, of that kind of cooperation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, we, we've seen the film and we have the privilege of, uh, you know, getting the inside track, you know, what it was like to be there this evening. And uh, as you say, lots of people on the ground, the three guys in the spacecraft. Uh, yeah, lots to investigate. Indeed, lots, lots to think about without further ado. Uh, we're, uh, well, dare I say it, Mark, um, Houston, we have a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. Couldn't resist. Uh, no, I couldn't. No, I couldn't. Sorry about that. I make a. I'll apologize. And uh, we are live with Fred. How are you doing? Are you receiving? Okay, just going to unmute you there. Okay, one second. We can't quite hear from you yet, Fred. We got to unmute. Of course, he's reading that. Fred, I'm not sure if you can hear us. Um, I think your microphone might be off. You might just have to switch that back on if that's okay. There we go. Perfect. Fantastic, Fred. Uh, what an absolute honor it is to have you aboard with Space Rocks tonight. Um, we have people watching from all around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I have to begin with a, a, a kind of an obvious question, but, you know, a, a bit leading as well. Um, you know, just in the past few days, we have seen... NASA announced that there's a big announcement coming on Monday related to the moon. And 50 years later since Apollo, it still continues to fill the imagination and to inspire people. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the moon still occupies the imagination the way that it does? Well, because it's uh, visible there all the time uh, for everybody to see any night, a clear night. Uh, generally, the moon's up there somewhere. Uh, it's near enough that we uh, have people go there. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mars has lately been pretty bright, bright red object in the sky, but uh, that's still a long ways away. And uh, even though people have seen pictures and uh, I'd say the you know, average person on the street uh, uh, has no, in spite of what you might think, because they don't teach astronomy, at least in American schools very much. I don't think they have any concept of the uh, scale of things in the universe. And so uh, it's, just, it's just the nearest object that is uh, conceivable to them is that, well, it's, it's not where we live. 
and is visible. So I think that's the uh, attraction for the average person. Yeah. I have to mm -hmm. say that just, just beforehand, I don't know if this will show, but <clears throat> I went outside. If I keep moving it around, it might show up. So that's the moon from where I live, and that's Jupiter above it, which is nice okay. tonight. So, uh, right. and Saturn nearby. So I think you're absolutely right, Fred. I think it's that that fact that there's a there's a connection in some way that it's also it lights up the night sky. It's it's an object that changes. It's somehow malleable, and as you say, it's close enough that we could dream to go there. Did did you have that sense? I mean, we you know we've we've seen the right stuff, the film where there's this sort of sense of people dreaming about going to the moon, even as as young men and young women. Did you have that dream when you were young? Did it? I mean, not in a real sense that you would go there one day, but did it speak to you in any sense? No, 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 not really. Uh, uh, my uh, my early uh, career path was uh, journalism. Yeah. Uh, back through the first three years of college. And uh, was not interested in aviation, uh, of course, which was available as a career at that time. Space, the real space program had not come about. So, no, I never had any uh, thoughts about uh, doing what I ended up doing <laughs> back then. So how did that switch come you, from journalism? How far did you get with that? And where did, that, where did the moment change? Well, I, I went through the uh, first two years more in what you call a community college. Today, it was a junior college in Mississippi. And it planned to continue on at the University of Missouri, which in the U.S. is a prominent uh, school for journalism. But uh, the U.S. was involved in the Korean War. And I decided to serve. And uh, it turned out that uh, where I was at the time, uh, 18 years old, not quite 19, uh, in two years of college, uh, the only program I could get into that led to a commission as an, as an officer, which my dad encouraged me to do, was the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. And so, uh, you know, how 18 year olds don't think a lot about what they're getting into, because uh, I'd never been in an airplane in my life, not even okay. sitting on the ground. So I signed up and uh, began to get a little worried when I, other people with me in my class. 64A talked about their experiences in light aircraft, and I knew absolutely nothing about what they were talking about. So, but anyway, it turned out the first flight I had, it was like magic uh, uh, to me, at least. Uh, able to fly around, look at the ground from above, and look up at clouds, and so that just uh, that changed everything. I said from that first day, I said my career is going to be in aviation, some somewhere somehow. So journalism was put aside, and I now was on that path. Uh, but uh, at that time, more in the avi thinking of the aviation world. Absolutely fascinating. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, uh, with that, you know, background in journalism, so much of the story of, you know, the space race, the story of Apollo was a, about, you know, incredible innovation, you know, just like a stunning, you know, uh, uh, amount of invention and just, you know, forging a unique path but also telling a great story as well, you know, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, conveying an idea, you know, that, that we could do something. And, you know, d did your background in journalism kind of give you a, a, a sense of storytelling as well? Because I, I mean, so much of it involved capturing people's imagination, not just the engineering work, not just the innovation, but also bringing people along in the journey. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it turns out I'm uh, just about completing a, a book and uh, a, a large section of that book is, is uh, catered to those days that I spent enormous hours with lots and lots of people, which was prevalent, frankly, across the program, but uh, my time was mostly at Grumman on lunar modules, uh, just with the intensity of the schedule pressure, uh, the, the, the work, uh, the difficulty, the challenges. And, and of course, uh, I, I still look back and say it was amazing what we did do with uh, the, uh, the technology we had it that day. I mean, for instance, I mean, every, every piece part in that program, the, like configuration management, was all paper. There were no computer systems. I mean, today you have computer systems that track configuration, and if you make a change through CAD or something, it ripples through the whole system and the training documents and the maintenance stuff. Everything was tons and tons of paper that people mm -hmm. dealt with. Uh, the, the, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, it, uh, the people, so many people involved, 
and that we didn't have more mistakes or errors than we had. It just spoke again to the dedication and attention that people paid to making sure things were right in, that, in those days. So, so, so coming to the question about the, you know, the, the human beings involved, <clears throat> again, those of us who are younger have, have kind of grown up with the myth of Apollo, uh, which, as Alex suggested, was probably largely had a lot to do with the journalists, the writers, the, the public relations people. How did it feel to be in the middle of that kind of myth making machine? Was it something you were insulated from or irritated by or, or bought into fully? Or was it just kind of, you know, a necessary evil in some way? No, it was, it was, it was a, obviously uh, an interesting, exciting uh, challenge to be a part of, but totally immersed in what had to get done from day to day. Uh, I fr frankly didn't have, hardly have time to read news. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. People talk about Russia and, and I had no sense of Russia, what was going on there. I was just driven to make sure what we were doing got done and that it was to the best we could do. Uh, I, I spent sometimes a, a week at Grumman. We had a little trailer outside the uh, clean room. And uh, sometimes almost in a week, I'd barely get time to leave the plant to go across the street to a place named Vito's to get a sandwich. Uh, some tests, you know, the test ran, uh, and that was true everywhere, uh, pretty much. Uh, we ran uh, test operations 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In 1967, we shut down uh, first shift because the snow had been so heavy that uh, workers couldn't get in. So we shut down that shift and we shut down Christmas Day. That was it. And that's the, uh, so that was the, the, if you want to call it, that was the, the to make the schedule, right. uh, the pressure <clears throat> was uh, just constant. Uh, was that Was that pressure feeding through from... The political side from the very top you know we have to achieve this before the decades out kennedy's famous speech or was it just you know it was the way things were at that time no it was, it was much the worth it started obviously from the top down uh with the declaration and uh and obviously the proper funding to get the program underway and done but for those at least at my level for those involved we were just we were just immersed at the job the daily job and the task we had of uh, getting the, the next lunar module uh, ready to go. So it's more, more than that uh, guy. Had not, I was not thinking historically about anything. <laughs> or, uh, and to me, really, uh, even uh, the mission I flew, I, I still look at it uh, not, not profoundly uh, as much as it was just a tremendous great adventure. Uh, I, had, I had no religious aspects uh, of, of that uh, incident. Because again, going to the moon and you think about it, it's not going very far, really. <laughs> uh, so to me, it was just an extension of my test piloting days and uh, just a bigger, uh, bigger adventure, if you will. Uh, ad ad adventure is definitely the way to describe it. I mean, it's the adventure of all adventures in so many ways, you know, but I, I mean, it might not be very far, but, you know, as an event, you know, the, the, the Apollo program was utterly transformative, you know, and I, I, I literally think the way that people think of BC and AD, it's the same thing. There's the world before and after in that sense. But in 1962, JFK gave that speech, you know, at Rice University, where he said, we choose to go to the moon, you know, were you conscious of the program at that point? And when you heard him saying it, did you believe it was possible? Because there's the span of time between it happening and that speech was not very far at all just you know a blink of an eye in many senses i no i certainly uh, was not knowledgeable and not about uh, even about uh, call it the phase a uh, studies or, or what they were proposing to uh, frankly make a judgment about uh, the doability of uh, accomplishing that mission I, that's what wasn't didn't have enough technical depth uh, to make make a judgment that way uh, it was interesting. Uh, Neil uh, Neil was Neil Armstrong was chosen in uh, the uh, uh, second group, and uh, from he was a NASA research pilot as I was. In fact, I followed Neil. We both started at Lewis Research Center in Cleveland as NASA test pilots, 
And uh, I was about three years behind Neil. I then transferred to Edwards, where he had been and flown the X-15 before he left to go in the program. Uh, and uh, even even later, as it, it, it was our, uh, this announced Apollo program, Neil came back uh, to, to visit back at what was then Flight Research Center, now Armstrong, named after Neil. And uh, Don Malik and I uh, talked to him about, well, well, what what's it like being down there at Houston and being an astronaut. And Neil's uh, answer was, I thought just a second or two, and he said, well, you sit in a lot of meetings. <laughs> uh, you sit in a simulator a lot. And it's not much good flying. So that was Neil's judgment of <laughs> Compared to, compared to what we did as research pilots, where you might be involved with three test programs at the same time, some more in a primary role, some in an evaluation pilot role, or some just supporting, but flying every day, literally, in multi, multi different kinds of aircraft. So, uh, and that's, and I have to say, after I got into it, that certainly was the case. Uh, but uh, so I had to think hard to, uh, about applying, frankly. Because uh, I would have been in the, uh, I was in the fifth group, actually the fourth group of pilot types. And uh, I was kind of uncertain whether I'd even get a chance to fly uh, with so many already in the program. But I said, well, if I stay at Edwards, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have a shot at going to the moon. And I said, <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, you know, I have to fly. I, I want to, I want to at least try it and ha hopefully have the chance. So I did apply and was accepted in, in that fifth group in 1966. If I, can I just go back for a second? Because <clears throat> um, earlier in your career, if I was reading right, doing my research earlier on, you're actually you're involved in the Berlin airlift as well. Is that right? In, in, in 1961? No, in, yeah, 61, uh, what we call the second uh, yeah, whole Cold War crisis. I was in a fighter squadron and... Ohio at the time. I was working for NASA at Lewis Research Center and was recalled for a year. And we were a special weapons outfit. It was kind of a scary time, really. Uh, I think back, in fact, in my book, I cover a little bit of that about the continuing concerning threat of uh, nuclear weapons. Because we were trained to drop uh, an atomic weapon, and one of our squadrons deployed to Etain, France, to a field and were uh, diligently uh, targeting, practicing. And we, we actually, as training did, I had, I had Prague, uh, Prague as my target. Mm -hmm. So I had to do all the planning, looking at the intelligence data of, of radar sites and plan the low level uh, run in to deliver uh, a weapon. Uh, probably an 84F could handle a weapon about twice the size of Hiroshima, I guess, at the time. So, but that was going on all over and during that time. I mean, we had squadrons over across Europe doing similar training. Uh, we had, of course, SAC bombers on alert. We had the missile silos uh, ready, the submarines. So it was, uh, it was very scary times uh, when I think back of those days of what could have happened. Uh, and it's uh, something that bothers me uh, that now we've grown so many countries with weapons uh, that we, uh, I'm not sure we're keeping track of them all, mm. and that uh, they're not as controlled as they should be. Yeah. I mean, the reason I bring that up, of course, is because it places Apollo in the context as well. I mean, it was a, an incredible technical achievement, uh, and, and for many people, you know, as, as Alex said, it's sort of a, a groundbreaking moment in, in what humans are able to achieve, but it took place at a point of, of conflict um, as, as a part of the superpower battle. Um, and, you know, we'll come back to Apollo 13 and, and the shuttle, but I just wanted to, you know, look at where we are today, of course, where we have an international space station uh, with Russia as a partner, of course, with the United States, with Europe, with Japan, with Canada, and now looking at joint exploration to the moon. So despite the fact there are still lots of nuclear weapons around, I mean, have we made progress, do you think, in the way that we're exploring space today? Well, space has certainly, I mean, you know, the... the uh work uh, we've done, so I was, I was a part, uh, another part of my life, uh, when I left NASA, I went to Grumman Corporation and ended up, uh, had a subsidiary company in, uh, in service business, and one of the contracts I won was the Space Station Freedom. 
I led the uh, contract we had for the system engineering integration of Space Station Freedom, which in my book, that chapter, I don't know if the title will stick, I call it my time in purgatory <laughs> uh, because of the funding, the funding hardships we had and trying to keep trying to keep a program plan going without being continually jerked around, which some of that's happening right now with Artemis, I, as I read in the news. Uh, and nobody seems to understand in government what it means if you start messing with a program plan. Uh, it's uh, scary. But uh, that, uh, that time was uh, uh, my involvement uh, in, in call it the other side as a contractor. And uh, it was, it was uh, interesting uh, times we, re, re, on paper at least, uh, restructured it three times, I think. And uh, but but finally came to pass, and it was it really truly was uh, international. In fact, while I was in the program, I had better cooperation from the foreign partners than I had with American contractors, the prime contractors, because they were so so buying for money and positions in the program, whereas I had no trouble with uh, the European Space Agency representative for Columbus and uh, the Japanese for the GM and and Canada, of course. Uh, so I, it was a, it was certainly space has been a very workable forum to have international cooperation and working together as a team, clearly. Yeah. You know, um, I wonder, going back to something that you said, Fred, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, flying atomic weapons, for instance, um, you know, the, the, the very well documented and celebrated events of Apollo 13, obviously, and, and so many other elements of your career have taken place uh, in situations that require something that feels like beyond nerves of steel, you know, um, almost like a, a superpower kind of thing to, to maintain a cool head in stressful situations. How much did being on the world stage add to that pressure? Because of course, so much of the space program that you were in, you know, um, and so many of them since, they're reliant on public support as well, you know? So it's, it's not merely the question of completing a mission. It's also the question of the perception of the public that it was a successful one as well. Did that add to the pressure that you were under during Apollo and since then? No, not, no, not during Apollo. I, I of course, uh, uh, was just another mission. Uh, we had already flown some uh, that were uh, obviously successful, twice landing on the moon. So no, I did not not feel uh, particularly the pressure of uh, actually uh, subsequently what happened. In fact, I worried uh, a little bit when that happened uh, in my mind about what that might affect the program, uh, as it probably did, and ended up canceling the last two missions. Uh, but I thought possibly it might stop the program right there. Uh, but no, but before before flying, I did not think about that at all. Mm -hmm. So let me just dig in on that. I'm, I'm not, you know, a huge Apollo historian. So I'm interested in your take. You know, there's, I've heard it said that the, the program was kind of canceled with, with 18 and 19. And, and I think you were slated potentially to fly one of those back to the moon. Um, but they were canceled also because, you know, the, 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 in the public domain, it was not because of 13, but because it was kind of boring at that point. You just keep doing right. the same thing. So, you know, that, that moment of 13, in a sense, probably almost re revitalized and energized people about because it, it put the focus back on you as people and saying, this isn't easy. This is hard. Right. No, it, it probably uh, did carry on to uh, do the do the mission, the three day uh, lunar land missions on 15, 16 and 17, at least uh, to get the funding to uh, improve the limb. And I guess the Saturn got to improve some too that allowed them to carry the higher weight. Uh, but no, it, uh, but, it, but again, it was like you said, it got uh, kind of boring. And uh, if you've seen one shot of a lunar surface, I guess they felt even though it was a foot bigger hills than some and a, a large reel than one, uh, you know, that was not intriguing enough. Yeah. So, so let's so, let, let, let's let's do the you know let's let's talk about Apollo thirteen. You've been asked every question you could ever be asked. You know what it was like to be there at that moment. Uh, you know the, the the Houston we have a problem moment. 
so so you know what kind of question haven't you been asked i mean in a sense i mean because it's also i mean alex almost went there right it makes it it's about heroism it's about it's about you know be, going beyond the extraordinary but you're a human being and you suffer the same anxieties and the same concerns that that every human being does and so can you you know without repeat you know again i i, I always i don't want to ask people a question they've been asked a million times so in a way i leave the question to ask yourself right well, I, I think that you said that I had so many questions. Uh, people ask it in different ways. Was I worried? Was I scared? Little children are, are franker and get to the point they think they all so, so nasty, you think you'd die. Uh, but no, I, uh, I, I never felt during the mission we were at a point where there was nothing else to do. And obviously then I had to face that question. Well, I'm not going to get back. Uh, so it, it, we we always were, were able to have the time to keep one step ahead. So basically, it's how the mission flowed. I mean, obviously, we had no plan for what transpired. It was ad libbed uh, in real time for a while during the troubleshooting to try to save the leak in the second tank for over an hour, and uh, it went from there. You know, with just well, let's figure out what next. We we got to get around the moon. It's at least get back in the right direction because we were, we were we were not on the return that would uh, at the time we we're not on a trajectory that would have got us home. Yeah. So that was naturally the first thing. Let's just figure out how to get them on a path coming home. And then uh, they started worrying about consumables. And uh, so the next thing was how do we cut some time out of this return? And so they scratched their heads some more the phytos and uh, came up with a large uh, largest maneuver we did after we passed the moon a couple hours that shaved 10 hours off the return that put us better into the uh, end of the box on our consumables with the lunar module. Uh, the thing I, I was worried about most, uh, frankly, was the time uh, for powering up the command module. Uh, we had seen even in the limb water had built up because uh, the water separator uh, and that the basic design, the thermal blankets, whatever in that vehicle were not designed to operate down to 12 and a half amps which is where we got to to make it back with the batteries. Uh, normal system, uh, if you're just sitting in coasting flight, would have been about 32 amps, and uh, power descent to landing would have been up around 60 to 62 amps. So we were down 12 and a half amps, got very cold, and water started building up. We could look through the netting walls that were the limb. There was no inner wall and see water globs around any turn and plumbing or around connector interfaces at uh, the wall. And then Jack and I uh, were going to power up the lunar module. Now, this thing would shut down for four days. Uh, this is a vehicle that was never meant to ever, the mothership, never meant to be shut down in flight. And we worried because they invented this very lengthy procedure. Uh, it was Jack transcribed. Uh, we didn't have any blank paper. So he had to rip, rip backs and fronts off checklist uh, to use carefully numbering the pages to, re to record this a very long uh, procedure. And we, uh, Jack and I, uh, you know, so mutually talked about it, rehearsed it, if you will, verbally uh, uh, several times. But then it finally came time, they were, they were cleared us to go, to go into the command module and start the power up. And that was delayed late because they didn't want us to start eating too early into the entry batteries, which was the only power left that we needed to get through entry and get the parachutes out, uh, that kind of thing. So frankly, when we got to go to start the power up, it was two and a half hours before entry. So we were two and a half hours from hitting the entry interface, moving now towards that 25,000 miles an hour roaring in. And we looked around that spacecraft and it was dark and we went in this dark spacecraft, uh, we had full of flashlights. And the first thing we, Jack got out some tiles and we wiped off the instrument panel because we couldn't see the instruments, just water covering everything. So we wiped that off and thinking about that water when we got started, the first steps were to push in circuit breakers on panels on either side of the vehicle on the large panel. And Jack thought about it and said, hey, said, well, let me, I'll give you a time, time countdown and let's push in only six circuit breakers at a time and hesitate a little bit. And then I'll call for the next six. He said, at least we'll smell if we smell insulation burning. 
So if we have an electric chart. And so that's the way we went through the initial power up to get all the circuit breakers in and that all went fine. So we continued with the, the power up and it was amazing. The procedure was perfect. Even where there were caution lights come on that would normally have stopped us. Uh, but they, the procedure told us, and when you do this next step, that, that light is gonna come on. <clears throat> so it's like business as usual and we could proceed on without being delayed. So we whisked through that uh, power up. Uh, the machine came to life and uh, obviously uh, performed uh, uh, tremendously. Uh, it automated uh, all the way through the computer, through entry. Uh, it's measured, I guess, as best they can to the ship. We had the second most accurate splashdown of the program. Uh, so, you know, performed, <laughs> performed remarkably considering the abuse uh, we did it for, for, for four days. But that was a worrisome time for me because we had this untried procedure, complicated enough you'd want to have tried it in a simulator about 30 times uh, before you knew you're going to have to do this thing. And we, we couldn't try it but one time. And it uh, that was it. Mm. <clears throat> and, and if I'm right, you weren't feeling so well at the time yourself, right? You had uh, kidney problems, which... Uh... Right. Yeah. The well. adrenaline the adrenaline didn't uh, make, woke me up enough. I didn't <laughs> I was alert. Uh, no, the, some people were worried about the heat shield. I, when I saw the uh, exploded area when we separated the service module, the, it looked like the panel had blown pretty much straight out in the way the material uh, shards of the thermal blanket ripped and torn, stuck out. And the impetus of the explosion was away from the, the direction to the heat shield. Mm -hmm. And heat shield is pretty tough <laughs> material. So I, I, it never really crossed my mind to worried about the heat shields uh, condition. Some people did. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just, uh, be before we go on, I, before we cast back to Alex, I'll, I'll, um, I don't know if you had a chance to see it yet, but a, a friend of yours and ours, Andy Saunders, who's been working on many of the Apollo images, uh, putting them back together, and he released a movie yesterday which takes the Hasselblad stills and makes them into a continuous movie of looking at uh, the service module with the big, the big panel blowout. Uh, absolutely astonishing to kind of see it for the first time as a movie flying by. So uh, if you look for that online, but, oh. but, but it's stunning to see, you know, the ruin on that spacecraft. Uh, and yet you, some, you came home. Yeah. It, it, there was a, a shock when we saw that the view, uh, because it, just to think back to the point of the explosion, it obviously been the big bang and the reverberations through the metal hulls of the vehicles and some slight motion, not, not a lot of motion, but we could hear, uh, I could hear at least where I was in the limb still, attitude jets firing, trying to hold attitude, uh, but nowhere near the uh, sense of what I saw uh, to cause, have caused that amount of damage. I mean, that was uh, much, much worse than I would have expected to have seen. Well, um, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, uh, uh, we should attempt something new here, Mark, but I could actually share the uh, the image um, if we would like, you know, this, which is something I, I don't think anyone has really seen before. Um, just to, I guess, give us a, a, a bit of a an interesting view of, of what things actually um, look like in case uh, people aren't aware of what we're looking at. Should we just have a, a quick look at it? I'm just going to pull that up now, <clears throat> which is uh, something that um, Andy Saunders um, created for us. Um, well, for, for the world to look at rather brilliantly. And, uh, and there is, I think, a, a world first in terms of that use of, you know, the existing imagery, which I think is, is pretty remarkable stuff. And uh, he's actually watching tonight. So a, a big hello to him, certainly. I mean, there's so much, Fred, um, that I know has been asked about Apollo, but but when you think back um, to it all, I mean, was it all of a blur? Because I suppose being in the middle of it all, there's, you know, the procedure, there is the reaction to what mission control is saying you should do and all that. What was, was there a time to reflect on the situation or is that just completely pushed out of your mind? Uh, you talk about during the time or post-flight? During, during the actual, uh, uh, I guess the sequence, you know, between things going wrong in Apollo 13, Oh. and actually getting back to earth. I mean, what, what, was there time to think about it at the time to, to, to I guess, take stock of what was going on? Uh, well, I, I knew in general what was going on because I had, of course, served as a backup on Apollo 8 and 11, two previous missions, and had been in mission control during those uh, 
as a front backup crew we normally were in mission control during all critical phases. Uh, so I so I knew, and through our mission sims, integrated sims with mission control, I knew the process and the availability of uh, help mission control could call on through the MER, the mission evaluation room, which had program office people, uh, had uh, more engineering talent, that also had communication with all the uh, major prime contractors uh, who could call in their sub subs, uh, subcontractors. So I knew the brain power uh, uh, was available uh, and that was true of every mission. And I generally knew the process, uh, how these things will work. So no, I, I specifically, I didn't know who was more, more, deep, more deeply involved uh, at the time, but I knew there was a lot of people scratching and uh, losing sleep probably more than I got in flight. Uh, trying to work some of these uh, issues. So no, I, I, this process had worked. We had problems on other missions. Uh, as you know, we almost aborted Apollo 14 and uh, 16. Well, those two almost did not land. Uh, so, you know, handling problems. And of course, the, the scary time at the landing of Apollo 11 with the alarms. So handling problems was not a unique, uh, unique thing. Uh, they, I think they had to do a little more innovation and invention for Apollo 13 situation, but it was a, it was a well-proven process. So let's fast forward seven years. I'm conscious of the time and we, and we could talk for hours, but conscious that we, you know, we shouldn't take more of your time than we promised. So let's fast forward to the picture, which I have in the background here, uh, 1977 and, uh, the shuttle uh, approach and landing tests, which, as you told us shortly before, you know, we came on air when we we're doing the technical technical check. That if anything, the pressure was even more intense on you during those because, you know, they were a critical moment in the shuttle program. Um, so, talk us through what it was like to have prime responsibility. You know, you one of the crews, uh, Engel and Truly, with you with Fullerton and Engel and Truly on the other crew. What, what was it like preparing for flying an eighty-ton glider down to the ground? Right. I might, I might back up a little bit. Uh, I consider flying uh, Enterprise, flying that program, as kind of the highlight of uh, my professional career. Uh, after uh, I finished the Apollo 16 uh, tour, I went into the program office. I worked for Aaron Cohen, who was the uh, director of the uh, Orbiter. And uh, I was in the te as technical assistant for four years in the uh, development of uh, early shuttle. Uh, I sat on the engineering change board, uh, looking at every engineering change. I led the ops team and all the design reviews. Uh, so I was very uh, germane in, in that uh, design development part of the program. And then to be named to the crew to go get to fly it the first time was kind of a wound the tomb uh, experience. Uh, and, I, and of course, I felt very deeply having been immersed that way. We had a great test team with uh, Deke Slayton headed it. So we had a, we had really had a small program within the bigger program that was working on getting Columbia ready to go to fly to orbit. Uh, with Deke Slayton as the head of the test uh, force, we had we had some of the best people: Bob Seek, who later became flight uh, uh, launch director, one other fellow who also came from Kennedy uh, as part of that team. We had the best of Rockwell's uh, test conductors involved from Downey. So we had a great A team to uh, support that program off by itself out at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, it was kind of the concern you mentioned was because of the timing, uh, we were fixing to fly this in 1977 and we had changed presidents. Uh, this program, if you want to call it, uh, who, who, what president starts the program kind of has their name on it. And this was Nixon's program because uh, he had started Space Shuttle. And President Carter had come into office in January. One of his early uh, acts in, uh, within several months was to cancel the B-1 bomber program, which is, you know, is not a space program, but nevertheless uh, <laughs> aerospace. And uh, there had never been anything in uh, the uh, debates through that presidential election. There was never any discussion about space. So you really didn't know where these, uh, where, uh, Mr. Carter stood and, and thinking about space program. I'd hoped that was, it was good because he was an engineer in, the, in his own right. But nevertheless, approaching that flight, we'd also had to announce uh, with uh, problems with the engine, problems with the tile system. 
a further delay in the possible orbital flight for Columbia. So that was also in the news. And uh, so, the, and we had no backup for Enterprise. The, we pro started the program with a backup vehicle, but due to cost constraints uh, in the program early on, we delay, we canceled that vehicle. And actually, as most people know, we changed uh, our, our structural test article OV-99, we turned into a flight vehicle by limiting the loads to about 80%, and it became Challenger. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saved the building another flight hall. So it's kind of cost savings were done to try to hold schedule. But approaching this flight, uh, I had those thoughts in the back of my mind uh, about what would happen should I have a problem, and uh, I in crashed Enterprise or damaged it. Uh, could be the uh, end, of, end of the shuttle program right there. It was reflected in a funny way, now funny. Uh, <laughs> at the time, Gardo and I got to crawl in the vehicle that morning to the first time we were going to release it on Free Flight One. We found on either side of the ladder as we climbed up to get to our seats a Polaroid picture. And it was of a figure wearing a blue flight suit like we were wearing. It actually had our helmets, so I knew the suit techs were involved in this, this sh shattery. And uh, our very flight helmets, and they had the oxygen mask dangling, but the visor, the visor down, so you couldn't tell who these figures were. And they're sitting on this huge floor sweep, uh, street sweeper, kind of sweep a major city street uh, in, his, in his hangar. And uh, the figures are sitting up on, on that uh, sweeper, and the saying beside it uh, written was, if you follow this up, this is your next job. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the ground crew uh, were worrying a little bit about uh, how things would go with Enterprise uh, that morning as well. No pressure, <clears throat> no pressure. I, I have yeah, an anecdote if I can. I mean, I'm not gonna get the chance to share it with, with somebody so involved in the program ever again. So. <clears throat> the 19, this was 1977. A year later, I learned to fly in light aircraft. And then four years after 1977, um, I was at university and I was in the, the sort of the British equivalent of um, the ROTC, so the University Air Squadron. And I went for a, a weekend at RAF Cranwell, which is where um, the Royal Air Force trains its pilots to fly. So there were lots of young pilots, first, first flights. And that weekend was the landing of STS-1. Um, uh, and at least I, my memory of it is, and you probably remember it very differently, but that landing came in fairly, it seemed quite hot, and then they dropped the nose on, you know, quite hard, you know, Navy style, let's say. Um, and I just remember the whole room cheering, not because it had landed successfully, but they dropped the nose, and they'd all done that in their flight training as well, right? So uh, just to be in a room full of trainee pilots watching that, that first shuttle flight. But 1977, I mean, again, you had these various flights, captive flights, and then with the, with the, the tail cone on here, and then the, the, just those couple of flights with the, the engines revealed. I mean, it seems to me it was a very compressed program. Was that, again, part of the schedule, or did you get everything you needed out of the program in those few flights? Well, we actually, uh, the, fir the first release flight uh, this, in August, uh, was only two weeks late from a schedule we had published uh, two years before for that flight. So we, that we had that, that, that part of the program, at least, was pretty much on schedule. Uh, we felt we had accomplished enough of the uh, DTOs, the design test objectives, uh, that we curtailed the flight. At one time, we had, like, I think, 12 flights scheduled. And at one time, 18, I think, and we cut back even before. And uh, so we, we, finished, uh, we finished the program earlier by quite a few months than we uh, originally expected. So we had only one uh, major uh, hardware problem. Uh, Joe and uh, Dick on the second flight uh, had a, a leak, a hydrazine leak in the F section. It did cause some damage to some wiring, but amazingly they, uh, they worked a, a, a trap fix for the, uh, the hydrazine uh, in case that happened in the future and uh, got the rewire harnessing redone and we did not even slip the next flight. 
that uh, Gordo and I were then training. We kind of alternated who flew. So that, that was done in, uh, again, very crisply. So the whole, for a test program uh, in as complexity as the orbiter was, even with the lack of the, all the orbital systems, uh, was a highly successful test program. So I'm curious, you know, just uh, from your perspective, uh, you know, how did the culture of NASA or, or indeed, you know, all of this, you know, work to, you know, in human spaceflight, how did the culture of NASA change between the 60s and the 70s, perhaps? I mean, you, you, you've, uh, you said something very interesting, which is kind of extraordinary when you think about it. People seem to get used to the idea of images coming back from the surface of the moon, you know, very, very quickly and so on. I mean, how, what was your sense of a, a changing culture within the organization, but also with people's perception of human spaceflight? Well, I, to me, there were two things going on. First of all, shuttle in a way, which NASA, frankly, had hoped at a time, it didn't turn out, would be economically enough to uh, turn it over, if you will, to a quasi-government uh, entity, much like ComSat uh, did in the early days for satellite business. Uh, but it turned out, obviously, be much more expensive than ever planned and would not be viable in a commercial sense. Uh, so it was, I was strapped with that. And they had to deal with the same thing you have to do in military squadrons or anything like that, where you're where you're doing kind of repetitive business. Now, this, this, the satellite or experimental parts of, of the what was done on shuttle was new each mission to mission, but you're just flying it up and down part, uh, getting it up and down was you know kind of repetitive, and uh, you always worry about complacency. And we had uh, in the squadron, you had regular. Uh, safety meetings and uh, if there was any mishaps anywhere in the whole Air Force or the whole Navy or whatever, those were discussed. So you tried to keep people up on the edge. And that had been the case in previous programs because really you look at it even in Apollo, every vehicle was almost like another prototype. It was not, we, were not, we were never two a production uh, bird, so to speak, in that case. So it was, uh, and, and missions were, were done differently in some respects too, as well for the landing. And uh, so it, it, it kept everybody more on the edge. There also was not the same driver of the uh, major new program, which also adds the enthusiasm, the excitement of this, this the new thing we're gonna be doing. And it's a, a bigger, different challenge uh, so shuttle didn't quite have that uh, with it as, as we progressed on through the flights. So I think some of that uh, was in, in that. In fact, there was really no new developments. Uh, overlapping in that period were some of the early space station studies, you know, phase A type studies. But it really uh, kind of meandered around that for several years before it became uh, more into a call it approach in a real program with a phase B. And, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, I ended up getting into that with the uh, Space Station Freedom uh, contract. So if we look at where we are today, um, you know, the, the, the celebrations last year of uh, the first landing on the moon and, the, you know, the program well, you know, another couple of years and it in, in the 50th anniversary sense, it's over. And here we are talking about going back to the moon and building hardware and, and getting ready. And how do you see that, though? Also, at the same time, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, talking to Buzz uh, a, a few years ago, you know, it's like, oh, why are we going to the moon? Let's go. Let's just go straight to Mars. Um, and of course, there are lots of reasons why you do one or the other. But from your perspective of somebody that did go to the moon 50 years ago, how do you see it in a kind of a... Not, not so much a technical sense, but, you know, a symbol of human progress, a symbol of where we've been, where we could have been had we continued with these things. Well, it, obviously, going to the moon is easier to do than going to Mars by a, by a long shot. Uh, the moon, other than what they're, they're going to find out if they are looking for this ice that supposedly is at some of the uh, poles, uh, which would be a, a new thing and, and ha have an advantage in several ways. Uh, if, you, if you kept at it longer range, I look at uh, one thing you're going to need uh, if you go to Mars and, and other than going there and picking up a few rocks and coming home. If you want to stay, uh, you need to have the smarts about the logistic support required. 
much like for an Antarctica station, where we're, we're manning Antarctica stations year round, several countries are. And uh, so the moon would allow you, uh, I call it, a, if you wasn't in too big a hurry, like maybe Buzz is to get to Mars, uh, you could have a, a learning period of uh, logistically supporting an operation on the moon, which is kind of an easier learning, uh, if you will, and, and what, what it really takes for the architecture to think about doing that to set up this uh, establishment and uh, continually support it till it may be possibly and hopefully could grow independent. Uh, so I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's a more viable uh, first step, if you will, down that path. Of course, people are always anxious. Uh, I am too, because I'm not going to live much longer. And I'd like to see all this happen. Uh, and, it's, and it's not during, during my lifetime. But uh, if, you, if you look at it longer range, uh, it's, it's better to have had that, uh, that experience and, and build up uh, before you take that bigger, bigger step. Now, it's not to say you couldn't make the single step to just go visit Mars and come back. Uh, would be viable in the not too distant future. But uh, beyond that, I think you got to look longer range. Mm. <clears throat> just, just pick up on, on one thing, I mean, it's maybe time for us to bring some questions in also from the outside the psychology of course of going to mars there is going to be well, there's going to be a long period of time where the earth has disappeared to a point in the sky that mars is still a point in the sky i mean at least going to the moon you know there are big objects there's, there's one big object you're going to and one behind you but still that sense of isolation the human psychology on top of all of the technology, all of the, you know, handling radiation sickness and everything else we have to handle. How do you see what we did in the 19, late 60s, early 70s? You know, is it, did it, did it, the psychological aspect, did that speak to you as well? Is it something where we need to, you know, put more emphasis in how human beings can even consider moving away from, from Earth and, and being away from everything that we know? Well, that certainly, yeah, that's obviously something we didn't have to deal with. Uh, the lunar missions we had, you know, were two weeks or less. And uh, we were all of the, most of us flew, we we're all of the same ilk, background wise, military. Uh, so, no, we, and we really didn't have to aim more too much about the interrelations of the people. We could have put any three people of us together, and I think we'd all done okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's some concern about, uh, that length of time, because a good, big part of that transit to Mars, uh, you're not going to have a very good view out the window. As you said, there's going to be dots of light, uh, either looking back at Earth or looking at Mars ahead. Uh, not much good scenery. Uh, and so you're going to be much more interpersonal in uh, who you're with to get along, I think, over that long, long period uh, we're talking about uh, for that voyage. Uh, the other uh, uh, talent you need that I've not seen uh, talked about. You know, you talk about the science, geology, uh, the, 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 maybe the piloting type. You, what you really need, uh, for sure you're going to need, is one of these people who's the super mechanic, fix it upper, uh, take care of anything that's broken. Uh, because there's no, you're not going to be able to stop at a hardware store en route. <laughs> And, uh, and like any vehicle, I don't care how much it's built and tested and designed, it's probably going to have things break. And, and you're, not, you're going to need to be able to be self-sufficient that way with either spare parts or the, uh, the new things you, uh, you feed uh, to, to build a part. And, uh, but you're going to need a talent like that, which I would not, I would not qualify. I'm not a good fixer up around the house even. So you're going to need that kind of a talent aside from the scientist or the, uh, uh, you know, what I, I call a good uh, system uh, engineer type, mm. uh, designer, uh, fixer upper, operator. I guess there are people, you know, you mentioned Antarctica earlier on. I mean, there are probably people out there who, who winter over at uh, McMurdo or at Concordia or at South Pole Station or maybe out on oil rigs. You know, there are people from completely different disciplines who are MacGyver characters for right. uh, the world exactly. they live in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they may have three D printers, of course, now, which they may be able to yeah, use. I've had the three D printer to make make the things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, and obviously duct tape. You know, uh, absolutely <laughs> yeah, <that's> essential <laughs> to take in any situation without question. Now, um, you know, uh, uh, it's amazing how quickly 
the time is gone. And uh, uh, well, before we go, I just wanted to thank everyone who's joined us to watch our conversation this evening. And, and we like to bring them in as well. And uh, we've had some really great questions and we won't be able to ask them all of you, Fred, but, uh, but there, there are a couple of similar ones. Um, Luigi and also Chris, um, Chris Lee asks, um, in different ways, you know, um, in the past you've said it, it seems it's only interesting to the public if it's the first exploration of another planetary body or if you're having a problem, you know, um, and so on. And, and they both ask in different ways, do you think Artemis and a return to the moon will capture people's imaginations in the same way? Does it have the capacity to occupy the popular imagination that same way? I, I think it will for some, obviously, that, w that certainly did not have the Apollo experience. Uh, and more broadly, because of the uh, partnerships and a number of uh, countries directly involved uh, and, and, and in that sense as well. I, I just don't, I don't look at it as the same, uh, you know, it's always, it's like a first flight. Uh, a first flight is always the most exciting. And uh, so we've done a first flight. So it, it won't have quite that luster that I think Apollo had, as it, this is now the first time we're going to do it. Uh, but certainly, it uh, for those that didn't get to witness that, this will be uh, in their, their minds at least to be their first flight to uh, witness. So certainly, there will be some excitement uh, to to an extent that way. Yeah, I can't I, I can't help remembering. I mean, it seems crazy to me as somebody who's old enough to remember Apollo. When, when our Rosetta mission went to the comet, um, you know, uh, six years ago now, young people saying that was their Apollo moment. And I, and I never underestimate, I think, you know, the fact that things that are history to some people, they want, their, they want to live history for themselves uh, today. So I think you're right. I think for many people, it will have that, that same thing. But it, the questions will also be asked, you know, what, where do we go next? Because we have done this before. And is it is it on a path to doing something different? And I think that setting the future and not just putting flags down and coming back, I think that's the very important thing about it. I, 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 sorry, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say, I, I agree. Uh, I, I, I just wish there was a way to, uh, for any program, be it Artemis or whatever we do, to uh, have a better understanding uh, when the program is set out with the uh, what what has been done through the you know earlier phase A phase B's uh, picture of what it takes the architecture what it takes and a and program plan that, that no no program plan is perfect uh, but so normally you have a program plan with some margin uh, some reserve but that would be accepted more in a multi year fashion and that, that has never been done in the U S it's a problem. And uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure we can ever overcome the uh, annual budgeting uh, business in the U.S. that is very, very disruptive to uh, getting a job done, and and invariably uh, can end up with uh, overruns. Uh, and it's hard for an agency like NASA to go tell you know who that they caused the overrun. Uh, so it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway. But if you had to, and you had that, unfortunately, uh, not for, I should say, fortunately, you had the impetus from the President Kennedy on down that did properly fund even more, more than needed probably at the early times, um, all that was needed uh, on the Apollo program. And it's, it's been the only one NASA's had that has been that way. I, I, I hope that it to some extent, and I've seen it on other things, that having international partners can help as well. It adds a kind of sense of inertia. You know, if you've got international partners who've staked a lot of their time and money and, and credibility on a program, it can help keep them afloat. At least, you know, maybe, let's see how that works out. And um, uh, we have a question from Richie, um, you know, who asks, um, is there a bond that you feel with uh, uh, other generations of astronauts, people who have traveled in space? Is, is there something that uh, makes everyone relatable who's had that experience? I, I really, I don't know how to, how to say that. I don't know many of the, uh, obviously what you call the younger ones that have flown even in shuttle beyond about the first uh, two groups that got pulled in. I knew, got to know them well before I uh, left the program. I've encountered uh, some uh, when I was in the business world uh, for the first, uh, four years at Grumman, I ran space programs in New York. And I, we had a simulator that could emulate the uh, Canadian arm, the, the dynamics. 
and uh, we were we had bid and won the um, uh, manipulator foot restraint, the thing that astronauts perch on at the end of the arm to do work on satellites or whatever. So we uh, we had this actually it was a converted V stall airplane simulator with a re- remodel obviously uh, to do this job with uh, and have astronauts uh, visit. And we had about four or five visit and uh, perched on this thing. And with, by doing tasks with tools, they could feel uh, what, what dynamics they were importing back into the arm uh, kind of thing. So that's about the only professional uh, ties I've had uh, with any of the, I call it even then, what you called younger, which is probably the third or fourth generation astronaut uh, people that came in. Uh, beyond that, I've only met uh, made, made, met them for the most part at uh, social events, uh, probably mostly with the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, and uh, but have, have never been uh, technically uh, involved in uh, in NASA contracts except for that first four years at Grumman, because then I went off and formed a service company, a subsidiary company for Grumman in the service business. Now, I did have NASA contracts. I had uh, 12 years, uh, I had a contract as part of the uh, shuttle processing. Mm -hmm. So turning shuttles around, uh, I had the launch control center and some of the equipment around the launch pad and uh, the base-wide instrumentation, uh, but served uh, on a more management role under the prime Lockheed. I ran uh, a, a board, if you will, we set up to oversee the operation and look at any problems. In fact, I ran an in-house uh, accident board after Challenger. Uh, more, of course, we were worried about contract liability. And uh, so we ran that sort of in-house uh, under the umbrella of, of course, the bigger presidential commission that went on. And uh, so I, I, you know, I had an involvement 12 years with shuttle that way uh, before I then went off to space station. <laughs> <clears throat> So you, you know, people know, but for those who don't, uh, you, you left the shuttle program, but you, you were assigned to a flight uh, or would have been. And then, of course, it moved out a couple of years. You decided to leave at that point. I don't want to put you on the spot, but, you know, what, how was your decision? How was your decision making at that point? And what was your thinking? Well, I would have I would have stayed if we had kept the mission. I was uh, I and Jack Lausma were going to go up and do a rendezvous uh, with Skylab, which was uh threatening to fall in. And we were training along that path. Uh, Jack was doing quite a bit of training with Martin who were building a small uh, kick stage that we would carry in the payload bay. And they had a simulator uh, already established at Denver and they could change the Skylab attitude or make it slowly revolving even so Jack could practice trying to dock with it even with small motion. And he he would have been the one that was training really to fly it out of our payload bay and go dock it, dock it with Skylab. But it would have been the first uh, space rendezvous with shuttle and uh, have that adjunct of the uh, rescue, if you will, of Skylab either to uh, dock that uh, booster and we would actually move away a few miles and uh, let official people on the ground orient Skylab either retrograde or posigrade, deciding if they wanted to boost it or more gracefully deorbit it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I sort of half fell in and the parts went into Australia, fortunately, uh, uninhabitable portions of Australia. Oh, that's, that's true of most of Australia. We don't say that about our Australian friends too much. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we have a final question, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really, really good one. At any rate, um, finish that. The, that mission went away. Skylab fell in early, yeah. and I was just not interested in the, the mission that then remained. And I had the opportunity to join Groman because I always wanted to go into management aerospace. And so I, I took the opportunity and went off to Groman at that time. But go ahead, sorry. No, no, uh, my apologies. Um, we, uh, uh, we have a final question and uh, uh, you, you dropped a seed at the very beginning of the, the, the conversation. What can you tell us about the book that you're working on? What can I talk about what? What can you tell us about the book that you were working on? Um, you said you were writing a book earlier in the conversation. Yeah, the, book, the book is not a, I would, it's not what I'd call a fluff book. It's, uh, it's probably not going to be bought by many uh, layperson. Uh, it's probably too much, much too uh, much detail. 
but it's it's part of the chronology of uh, things I've done uh, through my life, starting with my uh, grow up time, a little bit of background and growing up in South Mississippi on the Gulf of Mexico uh, into my military experience, uh, my uh, NASA experience uh, as a test pilot at uh, Lewis Research Center and uh, then at Edwards uh, four years. And, uh, and the, I had one year in the aerospace test pilot school, uh, the Air Force school, and then into the uh, space program. Uh, something about my early uh, time at, uh, at Grumman with some of the contracts I had, like with Boeing, we had the solar power satellite uh, study. It was an interesting study that uh, obviously hadn't gone anywhere, but uh, it's, I have a, have a real solar power satellite. Uh, but th- things like that, even in that era, and of course, then on to shuttle uh, more in the uh, contract sense and space station. And uh, just kind of a closing that talks to uh, challenges. And I, you know, I talked to ones that probably through my grandchildren, at least will be worried about is uh, uh, the nuclear threat. I'm really concerned about that. I think we get to got to like like mustard gas or whatever. We got to get rid of them, totally. <clears throat> and uh, the other one is um, meteorites and uh, comets, which we occasionally see some coming nearby. And it's kind of stupid not to have a defense system. I mean, you know, we it's certainly something we're very capable of. You know, both ASA and uh, America's had things that rendezvoused with comets or meet one just did, did with the meteorite, I yep. guess, and took a sample. And I took a two year rendezvous. We can't afford a two year rendezvous, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, to, we could devise a system that could, you know, we ought to have probably a backup that could handle should we ever be threatened uh, uh, that way. Uh, that's, that's another one. And of course, uh, the sense of the global warming that is uh, more prevalent upon us. Uh, and some people believe it, some people don't. I frankly am not an expert enough of study the data to make an opinion, but we need to be prepared to, uh, to move out and, and maybe, in a, maybe it'll be in a grand uh, project uh, sense. Uh, I, I kind of comment in the book, I'd be happy to run that project because if it really was uh, threatening to uh, life on earth, I think you'd have a good uh, motivated team. You could probably get all the talent you needed. Uh, you could probably get all the support you needed from whatever governments, be easy, easy program to run <laughs> <laughs> uh, to go solve the problem. But at any rate, uh, it kind of ends up on that, those notes and thoughts for people. So, so let, let me pick up on that perhaps as a, as a closing thought, because you've more or less answered it, but as you talked it through, Do you see space as sort of an integral part of our future in the sense of actually solving problems which we have to face here on Earth? Or as some people, I think some people, it's almost almost an entertainment, a distraction to some extent, that it it, it allows you to focus on something without actually taking care of the problems we have here on Earth. From what you're saying, it sounds like it's an integral part of solving our problems, not a distraction. Two two to three threats I talked about are clearly Space has strong environment involvement. There's no question. Uh, it, right now, it has invo- involvement, and hopefully, is continuing with different uh, systems that are put up collecting data uh, on the, the facet of the global warming, uh, and, w- and w- might be an instrument also needed as we attack, attack, really decide to really tackle the problem to look at progress. For instance, reconnaissance, uh, and certainly it, it directly is the answer to uh, a potential threat of a meteorite or a, a comet that next comet may not be su- sucked up by Jupiter like the, the last one that was pretty traumatic. Uh, Shoemaker-Levy yeah, yeah. Uh, that we would need to have to worry about. Well, if there's um, a person uh, in the world who's more qualified to talk about assessing problems and then dealing with them uh, I can't think of any uh, than you, Freda. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show on behalf of everyone at Space Rocks, but also everyone that's watching tonight as well from all around the world. Can I say it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show, and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. and And Mark, I, I've 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 got to I've got to ask the uh, the question now. Um, over to you. Yeah, I think this? yeah. 
I'd like to add my thanks as well, Fred. It's been absolutely fantastic uh, uh, to meet you and chat with you. And hopefully, you know, we'll get the chance in the future when we're able to do these things live. I know Alex didn't mention it, but Alex met you actually uh, in the UK um, a year ago or so, or maybe even a couple of years ago at uh, an, a, an event you were at. Indeed, at uh, uh, Destination Star Trek, uh, we are uh, up in Birmingham. And uh, that was yeah, uh, yeah. All right. yeah we did because we, we didn't mention enterprise and science fiction and everything else, but there is the connection. Enterprise, you know, it, of course, famous as the ship of Star Trek. So before we finish, the one thing we do always at the end of Space Rocks, and it's always a terrible thing. So we, <laughs> we have a little kind of hand signal. This, of course, is Mr. Spock's Live Long and Prosper. Okay. And then we have Rocks. So you're on the spot now to see if you can uh, right. match well, I us can, there. I can do the one. You can do the but Rocks. The, but the Spock one, I need a Scotch tape. To, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> to do it. And of course, you've met Leonard Nimoy because I know that the crew of, of the Enterprise came to visit this ent uh, Enterprise. So uh, <laughs> thanks, no, I Fred. I need the Scotch tape to handle uh, that little thing <laughs> Well, they won't be <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on and uh, for making science fiction science, uh, which Enterprise did with the with the other Enterprise that we all know about. Right. So, thank you very much. It's been a great privilege. All right. Y'all have a good day. Okay. You too. All Thanks. Right. Bye-bye now. Bye, everybody. Well, and brief, Mark. <laughs> You know, there are legends and then there are legends. And uh, can I just say what an absolutely lovely man as well. Oh, fantastic. All right. You know, to, to, to be able to get that level of insight uh, to somebody. And, and it's also, I didn't want to say it, but it, it is, it's a little bit like being an Olympic athlete, perhaps, or somebody, you know, a, a footballer. You're kind of judged by the things you do early. But Fred's had an incredibly rich life following that. You know, he was in the space program. He was in that iconic moment at Apollo 13, but they went on to fly this machine behind us here on those crucial tests, but then was involved in the space station and has been involved in aerospace uh, up until the point of his retirement. But, you know, as a, sharp as a whip today knows, you know, he, he said he didn't want to talk about politics. And I think that's probably a good thing. But, uh, but he, you know, it's also clear that these things occupy his mind. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to commit to doing something, put the money in and go and do it. And I, you know, I think uh, we'll see. We'll see we'll see where we get in the next few years. Hopefully Fred's around to see us uh, put humans back on the moon. That, Indeed. that would be quite something. And, uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, yeah, echoing your sentiments, you know, something, uh, uh, there's something both inspirational uh, uh, and also just, uh, just kind of breathtaking about, you know, his humility in it all. How matter of fact he is about everything he's done because pretty much everything he's done is absolutely extraordinary. You know, perhaps, beyond just the, uh, uh, well, what we learn from his adventures. Um, there's also something we can learn about just like the, the human qualities that we should be striving for as well, because uh, what, what a generous person didn't have to do this. He just wanted to. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like we've all been enriched by it all because, uh, you know, what a dude. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Indeed. let's see, um, you know, episode 26. Uh, let's see where we get in, the, in, you know, in the next episodes of Uplink. Who knows Indeed. what might happen next? Indeed. Well, uh, well, uh, well. Thanks to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, uh, uh, do pop by spacerocksofficial.com and sign up for our mission update newsletters to receive news about future uplinks. And uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just hit subscribe while you're there. And um, we'll be back uh, very soon, indeed. So uh, watch this space. <laughs> well, I had to. I had to. Yeah, I know you I, had I, to. Right? What can you? What can you say? <laughs> Cheesy. Very good. We'll see everybody. Thanks very much. <laughs>